Greetings, future fossils. For those of you coming new to the show this week, this is another rather untraditional episode. Normally, there would be an interview, a conversation, a panel here. But this week, I had some bizarre difficulties recording the scheduled interview and equally bizarre audio difficulties requiring extensive surgery to the one interview I have in the can to publish here soon. So as I beg your forgiveness slash encourage your elated anticipation of the next few conversations we'll be posting to this feed, it seemed like a good time to catch up on an old and overdue project that I've wanted to do for you beloved listeners for a while now, which is author read recordings of my essay series, How to Live in the Future. This is an ongoing and open work in progress. This is a book I've been talking about writing for several years. And in fact, the the earliest entries come from around the same time that I launched this show back in 2016. How to Live in the Future is an exploration of time as a multidimensional hyper object and evolution as a creative improvisation twirling within that hyper object, uh, a process in which we all find ourselves participating. How to Live in the Future is a toothy critique of singulatarian futurist nonsense, as well as the equally partial doomsaying. And we seem to be caught in either one side or the other of this dichotomy. And this series of essays is a way to try and help people lubricate themselves out of that particular double bind a way to encourage a sober but playful attitude toward the myriad and always growing diversity of the products of our evolutionary enactments. A world that, as it seeks rest, generates activity more splendid and specious than we can even understand. As usual with this show, I'm kind of caught between a commitment to the evergreen and to speaking to the moment in which we currently find ourselves, the vital questions raised by the recent social unrest in the United States and elsewhere deserves a direct address. And I thank you for your patience with me as I ensure that I do not simply continue to stack the guest list of this podcast with white guys. It takes more time, more planning, more intentionality to find the best conversations I possibly can for you to talk about how to live with and navigate the challenges of this historic moment. In the meantime, I hope you'll take these essays in the spirit that they were written as perennially useful, as tools for which you can find your own use and purpose for your circumstances, wherever and whenever they might find you. But before we get into this, I want to thank the new Patreon supporters for Future Fossils, Fury Bean, Paul Dunscombe, Heather Ray, and Richard Taggart, who have demonstrated their awesomeness by stepping forward and contributing to the financial sustainability of this program. I work multiple jobs, I'm a dad, and yet I am committed to continuing to bring you the absolute best podcasts and music and art and writing that I possibly can, staying up until awful hours in the morning to ensure the peace of mind and solitude required in order to provide deep work to you and to everyone else as consistently and reliably as possible. And I thank you all for finding value in this work and supporting it. If you believe in what I'm doing, trip on over to patreon.com slash Michael Garfield. And uh, at the very least, join our book club for two bucks a month. This month, we're going to tackle the extraordinary trilogy Lilith's Brood by Octavia Butler, the first science fiction author to ever win the MacArthur Fellowship, a complete badass who wrote a very unsettling and awesome series of books about the dynamics of power and of otherness 
that I think makes her easily one of the most relevant and important science fiction authors we could be discussing this summer. So I'm really excited to start hosting those calls on July 19th. There is still plenty of time to get involved if you are interested in doing so. Or, you know, just email me for an invite to the Future Fossils Discord server, which is sort of like the secret clubhouse behind our Facebook group. Uh, Whichever one suits you, I guess. But I'm finding that the discussions in the Discord server are much more focused and uh, generative and that we're forming a cool little community in there. So if you're not part of that and you'd like to be futurefossilspodcast at gmail.com, which is also a great way to reach out to me for any other reason that you might have. That's all for now. Stay tuned. I'm recording two new episodes this Sunday and uh, really, really eager to get those to you. But for now, here are the first four essays from How to Live in the Future. Thanks for listening and have an excellent now. Part 1. The Future is a Place. I'm going to spoil it for you. How to live in the future is by being present, here and now. But then, it's not that simple. What we call the future isn't something out there to be held. It's an idea that varies drastically between us, and between each one of us, one moment to the next. A better way of thinking of the future than as though it's some approaching comet is to think of it as our horizon to the west of now, a moving point of reference that everyone sees differently depending on where we're standing. Consequently, most of what we call the future tells us more about where we are now than where we're headed. Things are never all that clear from far away, and there's no guarantee we're moving toward that point and not some other. So when the futurists, the real ones, speak of futures, What they mean is that there are a myriad of points along that far horizon, and that it makes better sense to talk about the future as a spectrum of potentials than as if it were the preordained and manifested destiny the corporations and the prophets want us to believe. I have this thing about imagining the landscape of experience in geographic metaphor. Example, I just caught myself describing the lump sum of everything we know in life as landscape. Our human memories grew out of neural networks that help orient an animal to landmarks, ironically, originally watermarks, as this was going down in ancient oceans. So it's no surprise that math explores the n-dimensional, or that most human cultures think of future as a thing in front and past as something back behind us. We don't visualize time the way we visualize space, unless you're with me in the radical perspective that time and space are somewhat meaninglessly differentiated. Time is space, and space is time, and calendars are close to accurate reflections of the way time spreads invisibly across the warp and woof of hyperspace. I recently discovered that I'm one of 1 in 50 people that has time-space synesthesia and reflexively, habitually see the year in some consistent pattern in my mind's eye. I'm always standing on a giant ring, December-January at the 12 o'clock divide, July and August there at 6 o'clock, and as I write this now, I'm moving counterclockwise through the year somewhere around 1.30, since it's 17 November. This 3D projection doesn't handle multiverses, parallel dimensions, linear progression, any of that. It's an idiosyncratic system opposite of how I learned to read a clock, but totally persistent. This is how I store my recollections, looking up or down the ring, the anum, Not exactly a mnemonic memory palace, but nonetheless a spatial system for organizing and referencing experience. I was not at all surprised to learn the hippocampus grew from some fish proto-GPS. When I attempt to visualize the future, as I learned to think of it in childhood, I see the image of a silvery metallic shifting sphere, presumably the boundary of some 4D portal casting shadows into the mere three dimensions that my pitiable primate eyes can see. 
Whether this is my enculturated mind presenting something physics experts tell me is the probable appearance of a window into other times, or whether it's a genuine prophetic third-eye vision of the portal through which we can gaze at all of our innumerable futures, or it's allegory and the image represents the newospheric nanotech that wraps our planet in a skin of thinking mercury, or I am actually observing my own body from the point of view of someone living in the future, someone who has cybernetic eyes and sees the spherical magnetic field projected by my heart, I do not know. Perhaps it's all of these. Perhaps that is the point, that our above-below and inner-outer dyads do not serve us in the future. And the meaning of this image is that time tends toward holistic, holographic, fractal, and recursive incarnations. That the evolutionary arc, defined by entropy, assembling organisms as a means for moving energy effectively through space, results in Pierre Teilhard de Chardin's omega point. Indeed. But that it is already so, the one thing that we all already are, just organizing its internal organs to present an ever clearer and more luminous arrangement on one side. And that's why New Jerusalem appears in Revelations of the End Time, and our Big Bang mythology so closely imitates the scene of hell. That all of this is happening at once. That's what the current state of science seems to tell us anyhow. And all the psychonautic maps of glass chrysanthemums and God's eyes portals and glass onions are the intuitions of this universal truth. That we are wound up hyperspherically, precipitating in a giant goldfish bowl with all the other stars and interstellar dust, which we observe as if it were a string of pearls, one moment to the next. But really, it's the whole damn thing at once, a party more precisely than a great parade. This is why I think that Future equals east, past equals west, when I imagine time along the spinning axis of a shape I only dimly grasp, which simultaneously is the world outside, and also me, my eyes the fire-projecting shadows of imagination on the cave walls of my unborn and undying consciousness. As William Blake said, the nature of infinity is this, that everything has its own vortex, and when once a traveler through eternity has passed that vortex, he perceives it roll backward behind his path into a globe, itself unfolding like a sun. Part 2. The future is more of everything. As Richard Doyle put it, sexual selection would appear to be a search engine for compression algorithms in the implicate order, an ecstatic browsing for patterns that will increase the capacity of any system to produce ever greater amounts of entropy. If you plan to live in the future, you have failed already. One of its defining traits is that it's unpredictable. We don't need a technological event horizon for this to be true, but they are actually quite frequent. The real singularity that Church of Kurzweil devotees displace into the fruiting moment of today's still juvenile ecology of stuff, that sharp discontinuity between what is and what can't be imagined, lives right now, and always now, and we're inside it. It's the canopy of stars we pierce when we embody old alchemical engravings, poking our explorers' heads out through the sky as limit of the known. It is the bardo of Tibetan mysticism, that chaotic space between our incarnations in which everything occurs at once. And every moment is the bardo, since our lives are tunnels made of gates, and every day is a new year. Every moment's an inflection point between the end and the beginning of innumerable stories flowing in all possible directions. If you don't agree, just sit and listen long enough and evidence will come. Perhaps the most surprising thing about this day that changes everything is that we're swimming in it all the time. If some omega point in hyperspace, the eschaton that waits for us at history's end, draws all mundane phenomena into its all-embracing unity, we're implicated in that vast conspiracy already. 
we can celebrate. But particles apparently pop in and out of being all the time, each moment a creation. All of it occurs at once, a party more than a parade. So point me to the singularity again. That said, the future seems to have a character that holds up to the deconstruction of our histories. It's more of everything. Defining time as the apparent movement of relationships between entangled objects, space as measure of entanglement. Time's arrow points to greater entropy, an isotropic, isomorphic cosmos in which every game's been played and all can come to rest at last. But en route to that final moment, entropy as evolution seeks the best fit path to oceanic stillness and contrives the paradox of order as a means to emptiness. The metabolic flurry of our intricate ecologies, no niche unoccupied. The fractal map of river deltas fitting neatly over our phylogenies and food webs. Winding tributaries and the tangled bank of Darwin's evolutionary wilderness take shape as the inevitable system-seeking rest, its filaments forever reaching from the trauma of explosive origins to grasp at peace in full and evenly distributed disorder. Every action has its equal opposite reaction, though. The liberating march of progress, Eros constantly transcending limitation by devising and inhabiting more brilliant and adaptable new bodies, is actually the very definition of conservative. The conservation of momentum, energy, and information as the cosmos rearranges its components to achieve a quicker peace by stepping on the gas and dissipating everything more rapidly. The answer to the ever-loving question of how order comes from chaos is that order is just more efficient chaos? An accomplice, not an adversary. Every tidy desk results in larger landfills. Every landfill is a mine awaiting artificially intelligent trash harvesters. The ecosystem that matures to weave together DNA and carbon nanotubule microprocessors in an Anthropocene beyond the oversimple categories of man and nature is itself one giant dissipative structure functioning as an excretive organ of the sun as it assists in the accelerated burn-off of the Big Bang. So, two things collide to make a third. The third thing causes a more intricate relationship between the now three things that make a fourth. Each novel species founds new niches that are filled as soon as luck mutates a nearby organism up the slope of fitness to become a key to fit the lock. The whole thing drives itself. The ever-deepening complexity of Gaia, just a crystal growing in solution, ratcheting on up the double helix, just the natural consequence of radiating heat. Intelligence is implicated in this. More complex environments create the need for teams of individuals to form and endosymbiotically enfold their members into larger creatures, smarter creatures that have more sophisticated needs and new dependencies. And these conditions favor more diverse and intricate societies, which count toward the increasing intricacy of the whole ecology, which favors teamwork as a strategy, and on we go until the internet appears to link each nucleus of nation, state, and corporation into one great planet-wide amoeba, and beyond, our pseudopods already reaching into extraplanetary space. And so it is that evolution tilts the narrative toward more of everything. We didn't leave bacteria behind when we got into bigger and then bigger huddles and grew tissues, organs, spines, societies. We made a hundred billion previously undreamed jobs for germs to do. It was and is in that eternal and apocalyptic light infusing all of time, a transmutation of the flesh, the simple taken up into the great complexity of something both ineffable and vast and unimaginably generous. No evolutionary layer left behind, each one the platform for and beneficiary of the next. And when we fuse with our machines completely, we will not render humankind extinct, but will explode in our diversity to offer every variation possible upon the theme of human, most of which do not exist today. The permeable membrane of the atmosphere, so wider than the borders of our nations, just as they were wider than the walls of cities means a bigger social body, made of far more kinds of people than were necessary to sustain the spirit of a fatherland or motherland. When cities came, they made us all a little dumber, as they made us smarter. Specialists in pottery or farming or religion lose a little bit of each as far as knowledge was before connected through and through to everything. 
and pottery was farming and religion, all of it one motion, not the purview of an educated expert. Presumably, and likewise, DNA was once more flexible than it is now, more potent but less realized, far less specious. Now we have so many kinds of jobs, they do not all have names, so myriad are human economic functions. And when our society has stabilized to know itself at global levels as a day-to-day -day sensation of each local human life, our tasks will be so fluid, numerous, and partial that we will have moved beyond the modern experts in both hyper-specialization and increased awareness of how minuscule our knowledge is to that of the entire commons. Each of us will be so much more, such empowered emanations of the biosphere, and so much less tiny in the corner of our wide experience compared to egocentric ancestors with relatively static jobs and personal identities. Eventually, we will take new bodies with each thought, the epistemic line erased between the generation as experiment by blind selection forces and the metamorphic flesh as proposition by machinery of spirit, assuming selves to take on certain tasks. The arrow is toward more life, more apparent choice, more radiant and dangerous diversity, all hung together, maddest ever symphony, admired all at once. This order which we organize and make explicit, the invisible environment of the cosmos's distributed intelligence as manifested in the biospheric webwork of thoughts as species, is already out there waiting to be recognized and drawn down from the heavens, metaphorically. That is one way the singularity is here already. It hasn't gathered, coalesced, and focused into history yet, but all of it already lies in wait, the eschaton at history's end impressing every moment with its tugging yearning, showing itself to us in and as a universe compelled to speak. And it can be no other way. The game was rigged from the beginning, which here means the origin between the Alpha and the Omega, not T equals zero but the architecture of the vacuum in which past and future happen simultaneously, and the end and the beginning co-determine which of all nows swaddles us between. We are a path drawn from all possibilities, the likeliest of pasts and futures shaking hands to meet as now. And that's why we get so confused about causality, because we haven't caught our talk of time up to the networked and nonlinear epistemology of ecological electric modern thinking. That's the essence of Time's Arrow, echoing Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, the narrative that our space-time projecting minds derive from pure unboxed experience in light of our best scientific work. The best fit story to survive in this worldwide webbed age is this. Time moves from singularity to intertwingularity, and all the while the great perfection is and isn't waiting round the bend for us the evolution of self-organizing parts to weave together an omega point that wakes up to itself at every level is the equal opposite momentum to the involution of the already and always order ever seeking novel ways to manifest in form, not just potential. Nothing new exists except new ways of saying it. The future is a dream we apprehend as best our tiny mammal bodies can. The poetry precipitating out of holographic all to shape and wag our tongues and typing fingers. And as we approach the eschaton to recognize it as the self we've been this whole time, categories like new and familiar explode beneath the weight of our original experience. The only thing that ever was, as it unweaves and weaves us and our grand predictions. So, in short, in some sense, it is hard to be completely wrong about the future. If you say... This thing will be remembered and repeated in some way. A universe in which all possibilities occur is more entropic, thus more likely. And that makes the only certain thing that we can say about the future that it is, and also isn't.
Part three, the future is both true and false. One more thing that we can say for sure about the future, it is both true and false. My senior year of college in an animal communication seminar that nudged out foreign language training, casting once again my sights too far, perhaps, and missing trees for forests, I learned that lies will never go away entirely as they are an Evolutionarily Stable Strategy, or ESS. An ESS, to get game-theoretical about it, is a viable approach to play the game of living long enough to reproduce in given systems such that new mutations can't disrupt the balance or invalidate the strategy. It is the stable basin of attraction round which all contingency unfurls and whirls, like stable ratios of predators to prey depending on metabolism, or the shape of wings evolved to suit specific flying gates. The parts may change, the pattern stays the same, with variations. The classic situation is the endless hawks and doves dispute, in which opposing tendencies toward war and peace reach equilibrium in fluid fractions. There will always be some balance, in which bellicose and peaceful personalities exist, in right proportion as the aspects of a meta peace, dynamic, turbulent, disrupted, yes, but meta stable, peace within which war exists in perfect portion, alive and held in tension like a runner's leg. The muscles don't accomplish anything if they don't pull in opposite directions. The ESS is why we'll never be completely rid of cults, for minds and cultures also follow evolutionary patterns. An occult is often quite a fine idea when faced with the realities of mystery and power. We forget that. We don't intervene in cultish thoughts when we're in the bubble of the cult itself, or notice how they're just a reflex action of the brain while being human. Hopefully, at least a few of us, whatever that means, do this on the regular in distant futures, catching fictions in the making turning intellect upon itself to weave a platform for the spirit of the age to anchor even deeper and the world soul to recognize itself in many bodies. The ESS is why we'll never be completely rid of lies. The lie is so sustainable because it's so ephemeral. It is so easy, cheap, and quick to lie on average. It cannot not be. A truth implies a lie. Communications based entirely upon the pretense, the agreement of our signs, and thus upon the risk of our deceit. We trust that words communicate the truth more often than they don't, because they do. And if we notice signs transforming in their meaning, then we all adapt. So nothing can remain alive forever. Misinforming signals ultimately bend to irony as villagers begin to notice that when boys cry wolf, it doesn't mean that there's a wolf. Lies die, or they evolve to serve the signal they were made to thwart. But lying is forever, since communication makes a trust surplus that life can't possibly resist exploiting. An ESS exists in an ecology, not in a vacuum. And members of a population, e.g. the hawks and doves above, assume opposing stable strategies that complement each other, but tend to make both sides seem crazy to each other. The liars and the cheats think straights are fools for buying it, and those of us excluded from the play of falsehood by our oath to truth all seem to loathe or envy criminals for not abiding by the social contract. But actually, the contract is with physics, as it happens that the ESS for maximizing entropy in dissipative structures like the USA is more of everything, including both sincere attempts at intimacy and disinformation of the kind that all of us now take for granted. Lying will persist as long as there are lines to cross, as long as there are others to communicate with. So you cannot really say and mean that lies are fully false, for each of them contains the truth, reflects it, and says yet more about the hidden mind that models and presents such falsehoods. I mean, you can, but then you would be lying to yourself, aware of it, and holding both perspectives from opposing banks across an oxbow of your fractal subjectivity and only ritually siding with one view to immanentize and involve and push against. Because God gets bored, so what? Our trans-ironic, or is it merely post-ironic present, 
is the greatest indicator that the future will be true and false. When jet fuel will not melt steel beams but did, and when rebooting cosmos means rewriting scientific history, and when our daily life's a perfect sphere of equal and opposing experts telling us that cell phone radiation does and doesn't give us cancer, fracking does and doesn't lead to earthquakes, that we have and haven't met E.T., well then everyday existence is a chance to watch the paradigm shifts in real time as our competing explanations for the most complete but parsimonious description of experience appear both outwardly as scientists and priests and inwardly as myths and theories. Incumbents versus young bucks, precious selves and hallowed old traditions versus the implausible, impractical, or even imperceptible. Just don't believe what all you think. Or do, because although the virtuality of private intuitions versus common objects of consensus shows a gradient of being, curving from what isn't to what could be to what is, consensus could itself be just hallucination. And you have to be okay with that. It's all a little dreamy, really. As we become transparent to the information processing from which ourselves and stances grow like automatic daisies in the field, the simple and traditional true-false no longer cuts it. At this depth, we can't even say for sure what it is that needs cutting. And so we waste less time on clashing certainties against the shore of other truths, truths just as vulnerable to essential doubt, and get on with the business of a practical, provisional, and hypothetical relationship to being. As every question answered generates more questions and the shores of the unknown climb up an asymptote approaching infinite unknowability, our most authentic scientists and priests will drop the pretense and embrace their former foes as fellow seekers. We'll get more comfortable with the dynamism, turbulence, and transformation of a digital society dispersed in cloud computing, wireless networks, peer-to-peer -peer instruction, horizontal gene transfer, the blockchain, and our always split attention as it melts whatever solid ideologies we stand upon until we're back to swimming in a fluid network, fish again, or maybe playful squid with flashing colors, ready for the mystery to take us all to school. As Walt Whitman says, do I contradict myself? Very well then, I contain multitudes. <laughs> Part 4. The future is accepted slash remixed. As William Gibson said, the future is here already. It's just unevenly distributed. Long before the first amphibian crawled out to lay our modern mythological foundation, our ancestor, some lobe-finned fish, had stubby little feet it used to cling to rocks in shallow water. The good idea of what we now call hands lay there unnoticed, latent, till the moment that the pool dried up and, we are told, fate benefited fish with feet, fish that could waddle back into their brackish lakes, which, as a site for epic moments in life history, are far more likely than the sea, since estuaries offer such a trove of coves as evolutionary test beds. All the pieces were already there, just waiting for sufficiently large waves to roll up and away, remixing them. The hand is thus an exaptation noun, which is to say, it is the anatomical slash behavioral result of exaptation verb, which is when evolution redeploys a trait for uses other than those it originally served. Because it only acts on what's available, it follows. Functions follow form until we act on form intentionally, more on that in a moment. This concept, exaptation, both the process and its products, yields a major revelation, 
that mutations do not have a single source or meaning. All mutations find their use in their repurposing. Life's major transformations, all the punctuation marks of evolutionary history, take place when innovations migrate from one continent or category to another. The irreducible complexity of living systems, even simple cells, is not the evidence of an intelligent designer. Features of immense complexity like eyes can be an aggregate of simpler traits that happened for their own distinct and prior reasons. Those reasons are themselves complex, webbed, myriad, unfathomable, irreducible. The pigments in your retinas did not exist at first to help you form an image. There are other reasons, such as UV shield or metabolic aid or camouflage, that life produced the range of colors we observe, and many that we don't, in other lineages. Invertebrates, at least some speculate, selection favored photopigments and the neural wiring needed to perceive their colors as flicker minimizers before anybody figured out that they were good for parsing spectra. Not to mention color vision atrophied and then rebooted. And how did we rediscover colors we had lost? Samely, wings did not suddenly appear on birds as flesh and bone from nothing, but suggest a kind of synergistic merger of their elongated scales for showing off and elongated arms for grabbing bugs and climbing trees. But those utilities were improvised before they were repeated, and then improvised again in every dino bird that rediscovered, for example, feathers gather the attention of the other sex. Again, and earlier, the dazzlingly intricate machinery of nucleated cells and all their busy organelles emerged from tightly interwoven ecosystems of relationships between much simpler microorganisms that combined like Voltron to dissolve their paradox of conflict and acquire new faculties, a new identity appearing at the interference pattern in between their smaller needs and capabilities. In every case, selection acts on what's already there and often more than once. It is the case that good ideas occur in many places simultaneously, just like evolutionary theory did, to the surprise of both the men who independently discovered it, the unsung visionary Alfred Russell Wallace and co-author Charles Darwin. It seems increasingly believable that birds evolved flight several times, and living species represent the one surviving line. It seems more probable with every publication on the origins of life that it could have emerged on early Earth, been wiped out, and then emerged again. And even if it spoils our myth, it's true that many different types of fish attempted life on land at once, about 400 million years ago, when fish with feet was bleeding edge. It's like the rude awakening of learning that the next school over's kids all look and dress exactly like your friends and that you're automatically fulfilling some invisible self-organizing social molecule. As Parahamsa Yogananda said, environment is stronger than will. Convergent evolution is the natural outcome of the same ingredients at work within the same environments and forces. We are chemistry, however noble. Most scientists today would differentiate an exaptation from a normal adaptation. Like the latter is a direct response to the environment, the former the co-opting of a trait originally shaped to suit some other situation. This was how Stephen Jay Gould and Elizabeth Verba originally meant it. This is silliness. Of course the origins of traits won't necessarily be obvious in those traits' later functions. But for evolutionary theory to stay true to its own axioms, then none of it's anticipated. None of it is purposeful. And none of it, until we started screwing with the process, was a conscious and intentional adjustment of an organism to its changing set of circumstances. Everything just happens. Fitness is determined once a thing exists. No evolution by informed consent. The possibilities of novel traits can't be predicted, only excavated piecemeal once they're in the world interacting. Every interaction changes the environment, so every trait exists before and makes the world in which its fitness must be tested. Every trait co-opts the pieces of the prior plays and finds new use for them in an environment it cannot help but alter. There is no original or final function. Every adaptation is an exaptation. Daniel Dennett said this first. That means that we will not find Eden in the past or future. By scattering our psychomorphic bias of intelligent design into the vastly more believable because empirically supported, wood-wide web. 
and Gaian atmospheric regulation, we bestow decentralized designoid agency to Earth itself, admitting that it's smart enough to improvise if not to plan ahead. As such, nobody planned the head, which we can call, poetically, an afterthought. Our era is in part defined by this expanding of the definition of intelligence, projecting the Anthropocene back into a new past in which life is always acting on itself. There was never nature as a thing apart from culture, and the notion of a virgin forest is ridiculous. If we learn to see the planet in this way, we lose our dream of privilege and come awake to just how smart and busy everything already is. Being the most intentional participants in evolution doesn't mean that we're the smartest, and it certainly does not set us apart from other life. Language as a means of horizontal information transfer isn't even new. It reinvents the promiscuity of genes among bacteria, exchange of modular identity among the simplest and least constrained varieties of life. By keeping DNA within the nucleus, our complex cells lost most of their ability to benefit from prehistoric P2P like this. So sex evolved. We had to find a way to shake it up. Which brings us back to exaptation. It's the law, because recombination is the way to maximize your options in the great entropic game called making use of all available resources. Life's modus operandi might be summarized as fill all niches. This invites a strategy. Call it a meta-adaptation, favoring what Stanford's d-school guru David Kelly calls fail fast. Try everything as fast as possible. Try sex instead of cloning your genetics endlessly and waiting on the right mutation. Then try language, so you can communicate a new experience before your listener has had that same experience. It's easier than coming up with and remembering new words for every damn new thing, as Martin Nowak pointed out in his work on the origins of syntax. Try exaptation to profoundly multiply the possibilities of creature multiplied by landscape. Every combination, one of countless parallel solutions to the question of survival. You might even say that evolution only is because the universe would like to find a way to dissipate itself as inefficiently as possible. And so it is that acceptations everywhere we look. Offering their masters up for remixing, producers let new life into their music, leaving many offspring, mixes, more than used to be the case for songs with only one definitive recording. And the catchier the tune, the more alluring it will be to pollinators, gathering attention, leaving strains of melody in memory that then go on to fertilize the ears of someone else. Ideas like flowers we did not invent. We just discovered and remixed them. Almost every major scientific revolution seems to come from someone outside the domain of their discovery's accepted expertise. A person whose beginner's eyes can see new meanings in the data. When all you have is a hammer, everything's a nail. Until you learn to see the hammer as an open-ended thing-becoming process. A protuberance of the original, expanding, and ongoing gesture of the cosmos. Then, it is an instrument of art. An invitation into sacred mystery and more. The lesson here is in approaching puzzles with the fullest understanding of our resources. It's equally as true in human innovation as it is in the diffuse cognition of the planet. Start with what you have. Start from facts at hand, beginning with the hand that you employ right now to grip that stable and familiar idea, the hand. Perhaps it can be used to get around on new terrain? Every future's laying all about in parts, apparent only to perceptive pattern recognizers who can hack the game to generate new plays. The reason Thomas Edison was not the first, but number 23, to file a patent for the light bulb is because the world was ready for it. He just made it market ready. The Fourier transform was not conceived at first to help with switching data packets any more than phones were made for hitching rides and storing payment information. But everything will find new life and new surroundings as convergent forces pull the opportunity and need into alignment. Every move we make then, we're remixed. By standing on the shoulders of our ancestors, or literally, mountains of their fossils, we reach new fruit on higher branches of the tree of knowledge. But the higher that we stand upon this mound of bones, the more that we consume and learn, the more we notice usefulness in everything around us. Some define intelligence as raw resourcefulness. If play is deep enough, 
we never settle on our definitions, and intelligence explodes as all the cosmos saturates with purpose. So break out of the way you think about your tools, or even what you qualify as tools. Everything's technology. Everything can be remixed. Nothing new exists except new combinations. And among the precious few things we can say with certainty is this. The future is accepted. All of it lives already in some latent form. If, as the Chinese say, our duty is to let a hundred flowers bloom, then all one hundred of them are now folded in their buds, awaiting that white ray of inspiration to invite them open. Take a look around you. Take a look within you. Who looks? Everything you notice is an instrument for forces you can't comprehend, achieving something that will be opaque to you forever. But perhaps your inquiry will coax one petal from its grip. If you approach your life with ample curiosity and don't believe the word just, as in only, when it rises in you, you will find a hidden life and purpose, sometimes many, in the boring and forgotten things. Take every work of art and turn it upside down. Play every instrument the wrong way. Lovemaking, like its maker, evolution, thrives on inefficiency and bad ideas. Make love to life by wondering if maybe you already have the tools you need to venture to that far horizon. The only poverty we have, collectively, is of imagination. Develop yours and watch the world transform. As I wrote in the essay, Acceptation of the Guitar, in 2008, every creative act includes a moment of decision, a deliberate projection of function and meaning onto the artist's environment. When I pick up my guitar and play, I'm agreeing that this is an instrument, that this is a guitar, that I play the guitar, and that I play the guitar in some specific way, that this is what it's for. But there are an infinite number of ways for the universe to express itself through the functional relationship between a human being and a guitar. It is restorative and inspiring to know that we are capable of exapting our world, the meaning and purpose we see for it now. Thanks again for listening. Future Fossils is a stubbornly, incorrigibly independent podcast with a very narrowly prescribed niche audience. And I deeply, deeply appreciate all forms of support, be they in the form of Patreon subscriptions or Apple Podcasts reviews or just turning interesting and creative people onto the show to possibly become a part of our community. If you enjoyed the music in this episode, all of it is off my album Pavo Music for Mystery, which you can find on Spotify and Bandcamp. You can follow the Future Fossils hashtag or me personally on Twitter and Instagram. If you want to reach out to me directly, Future Fossils Podcast at gmail.com. We'll see you again in two weeks. Stay safe and healthy and sane in the meantime.